Thank you very much. And uh, as usual, I'm extremely engaged with what Balu has had to say on any number of levels. Um, I think I want to make about six points that are mostly questions for us to pursue uh, because I, I feel as if uh, the best and most useful way of thinking together in the days that we have are to think about future projects. Uh, and so I'd like to begin with a set of suggestions about future projects, partly from queries about what Balu's saying and partly from a sense of agreement. So there's the projects that begin with our disagreement and projects that begin with our agreement. Um, the first thing I think that is very important to think about is a distinction that I think you could draw more than you do because I think it would further your own project and that is between Jewish and Christian realities. And I speak here partly as someone who is a practicing Jewish person but also uh, somebody who is very interested in the specific histories of the dynamics between specific religions. Um, and I think partly because I'm uh, so aware of the bloodiness between uh, the Christian and Jewish realities, um, when the ways in which you speak about Christian and Jewish realities, I think my suggestion would be that you're actually speaking about the Christian appropriation of much of Jewish reality. And the reason why I want to say that is not because, oh, you know, now you need to make that distinction. Good, I'll say that, but it's more important because I think the spirit of what you're about uh, is so crucial because I think there's a lot in the Jewish response to Christianity that uh, would be interestingly compared, I don't say comparable, but interestingly compared to Hindu, uh, wh what happens when the microphone's in front of the face. There's a wonderful uh, little story from Maharashtra about D uh, David Sassoon who was there to uh, do many interesting things around Jewish identity in Maharashtra who quoted a missionary saying, for 200 years, almost 200 years, 100 years for sure, we've tried to convert the Jews of Maharashtra and we haven't had a single one yet. And I want to conduct a study as to why. And there's that sort of wonderful moment in a way, um, the reason why I, t I share that little story is because um, there's an odd way in which your uh, theoretical program, the pragmatic way of speaking about it is, why haven't they converted? Uh, and there's, it's a very deep social statement that I'm making about intellectual life at a certain level. And th so let me just say a little bit more about that, uh, which is that the distinction between Jewish and Christian modes true God versus false God for Jews, and you see this in the very early Jewish texts, still have rules of engagement between Jews and those who rule them. Um, and mostly it's the case of how we can remain particular in our modalities at the same time as acknowledging that those gods are false. Uh, and with Christianity, many forms of Christianity, the rules of engagement are about what I call performed cognitive transformation. That's the phrase that I use for conversion, performed cognitive transformation. Um, the reason why I use it is because it gets at the specific from many different studies about what uh, is being done when conversion is being talked about. You have to continually perform it. It's not a one-act thing. Even though it's claimed as that, you need to continually perform it, and it is profoundly cognitive, as many people have argued. Um, those are the Christian texts, and, and the iterations about its relationship to Indic traditions are much of what we've talked about today. But Jews produced texts which said, how do we avoid being killed? or run out of our homes. So in a way, um, it's a very interestingly socially parallel situation to Christianity. Um, on the other hand, the present political situation suggests something entirely different. Now that Jews are powerful in certain political states, their questions tend to resemble more Christianity than before. So I think a really interesting uh, study that could be done as a future project would be looking at ways in which um, 
the Jewish response to, to Christian, the Christian microphone, as, as they say, or the Christian qu query, and the uh, Hindu response during the periods of colonialism that we've been talking about would be both similar and dissimilar. Um, and that's very different than the Hinduism-Judaism thing that frequently gets done uh, in our comparative world. So, so that's the first point and uh, uh, venue for future work. Um, the second really uh, revolves around the idea of the epistemology of the question. One of the things I've noticed in the conversation so far has been the ways in which um, the various modalities of questioning have become central to our conversation about uh, whether there are native traditions to, to India. Uh, the microphone has come up a lot. Um, the European query that was your metaphor throughout, questionnaires that come up in so many different scholars' work here, censuses and, and so on. And I'm thinking about ways in which it's not just the rhetoric, which is very important to, to think through your um, dictionary, the kosha that, that we're speaking about, but also the punctuation. Um, I think that there are very interesting ways in which things which previously could be understood as sentences, when they become questions in particular contexts, um, become rhetorically intrusive and then epistemologically uh, constitutive because they need a response. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if, if you had said your, or discussed your entire critique based on not the query of the European, but the statement of the European, how might it have shifted? How might it have been different? Or even the statement with an ellipsis at the end, uh, which would have understood something different than uh, a, a, an actual statement, but rather a hypothesis. Um, what if, in fact, the colonial situation, uh, we could imagine something other than the colonial situation where a mutual set of posing hypotheses were possible, something like Sambad about which I have written. So that's the second area that I think would be very interesting to look at. Um, the third is a query, and I, I just have to say this, and I know that you have answered it, and I think we need to talk about it, which is, um, have you considered, an, and have we all considered writing in vernacular languages? Because the, one of the logical conclusions of what you say, with which I deeply agree, is um, we continue to write in English, we continue to persuade in English. Is the revolution possible in something other than the vernacular? That's my way of putting that phrase very succinctly, and I would love to hear your thoughts about that, because um, I'm not sure whether it is. I don't know the answer. What I do think is that we would need a and this is a very important point that is worth iterating, um, we need a vernacularization of English. Um, and that would be one way, if I were you, thinking about our own sambad, uh, that uh, I would answer the question. That is to say, and I loved Sharada's comment this morning about uh, we had to comply with the translation. It's a wonderful way of thinking about all forms of translation. She was speaking specifically about Manu, but Yagnyavalka and many other <laughs> Indian texts. Translations being performed in a non-compliant way, we see a lot in the political theory of translation these days where one refuses to translate certain words and also in Indian writing and English, many different ways in which that's spoken about. But what if we took the next step and insisted in a writing letter writing campaign to Webster's and to Oxford and everything else, that those words we refuse to translate become English words. What would happen? So in addition to writing in Bengali, Hindi, uh, Tamil, etc., cetera, um, what if we, we continued a very careful and um, uh, considered campaign to vernacularize the universals, uh, universalizing languages? I think it would be a very interesting idea.